<laughs> just another welcome to everyone. Before we do our meditation, just want to say such such a such a joy to be here with Chandra in person. This is the first time in more than two years. So we've both gotten to be here in person, but to be here together is um, it's really sweet. And we just never know. And I really I've said this before, but something about this returning and coming back to in person I still feel the preciousness and the sweetness of being together now knowing that anything could happen anything has happened and wanting also just to welcome everyone to this space some of you have been here before maybe others it's your first time the san francisco dharma collective is a completely volunteer run space so the center is made possible by some of the amazing voices you already heard tonight and others. And as a volunteer run space, it really is, as Mace was suggesting, it's a community space, a space where a priority for us is that people feel that they can show up and receive teachings. We can't ensure, but our aspiration is that people can feel safe and at ease here. This is a space where we really uh, cultivate community through communication. So when we are communicating with one another, just to keep in mind that it's important for us to bring our practice into our speech, into even ideally our thoughts, what we're thinking, and of course, into how we're interacting with one another. So for some of us, I know someone shared with me tonight, it's their first in-person sit in two years. So let's go, let's go gentle on one another, right? And some of us might be excited about hugging others, maybe not so much. And for those of us in our online community, I think we're really developing our ability to hear wisdom from both sides. So the last time um, I got to be here in person with you all online, I, I feel like we had just a wonderful dynamic um, interaction. So really trying to hold each other mindfully in all of those ways. So in the in-person space, also in including and connecting to our virtual space. Um, one thing I, I will mention, you know, if there is a way that you feel we can show up more fully as a center that can honor and be open to people so they can feel engaged and show up, we would love to know. I know it's not easy to maybe share difficult feedback um, in person, so if you want to leave a note or find a way to contact us online. I'm sure there's an email on our website. We would love that feedback. It's a big aspiration for us at the center to continue to improve and become more welcoming. So one more time. Welcome, 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 welcome. So for those of you who maybe are new, we've been really joyfully making our way through this book. And those of you who are not new, you know that we are, we're making our way. We are tonight on chapter 14, view, meditation, and action. And Chandra and I were speaking earlier, and I was like, this chapter is the whole book, right? How do we integrate this essential view or understanding of the world as always changing into our meditation, into our everyday life? And of course, the best way for us to start here is in practice. So the meditation tonight will return to a favorite practice for this Sangha, and I think for Chandra and I, this settling of the mind in its natural state. So in this practice, we will really allow ourselves that understanding that the mind is always changing and not a cognitive understanding. We'll watch the mind. We will accompany the mind and observe. And I'm gonna invite us to enter into this practice through something that's called retrospective awareness. I shared, one of our shared teachers Alan Wallace taught this practice and kind of allows us to really fully show up here by really taking into account what's just right back there behind us. So bringing ourselves into a full presence by kind of recalling what has led up to us being here together in this day. So that's your sneak preview. For those here in person, if there's anything you need to be comfortable, there are cushions, there are blankets, please feel free to get them started, settled. And for those of you at home, grab your kitty and your blanket and your tea nearby. One thing we will ask is uh, there's a bathroom and water in the back, but please wait until after the sit, uh, if that's something you'd like to engage with. 
there will be someone coming in probably 20 minutes from now. Um, if the door opens, I know it, it can be a little startling just to know we have our fearless public education <laughs> warrior over there. Nothing's going to get past Mace. So even if the door is disturbing, know that you are, as, as, as relatively speaking, safe here with us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's begin by really connecting with our posture. It's so wonderful to have this opportunity to engage with the physical body as we enter practice. Not only is it helpful for our comfort, but it can be instructive for our mind. If our body can find a posture of ease, of vividness. That can be a way that our mind can settle into that very same state. Finding an upright spine. And feeling a sense of ease, relaxation through the front of the body. See if there's a place where your hands want to fold or be placed gently. That allows your shoulders and your neck to feel at ease. Notice how your head is sitting gently on top of your neck. Not sloped too far forward, not tilting back. And if it's comfortable for you, you can have the eyes gently closed, at least for this first part of practice. Spend a couple more moments here settling the body into a natural state. Where it can experience a sense of support from a chair, maybe a cushion beneath you. And inviting a quality of stillness, even amid the subtle motions within the body. As we attend to the body, of course, we notice the breath. It's gentle undulations through inhale and exhale. And so to help us settle the inner narration of our mind, let's focus more deliberately on the breath. Noticing the breath as it travels in. Noticing the breath as it travels out.
maybe for one full cycle of breath, we can experience an inner silence. Of course, we will have all already noticed our mind. Let's take a moment here and invite a quality of spaciousness and openness to the mind. Pouring our attention and awareness fully into the body and breath. As though we were saturating all of our attention and awareness with the body. Just a couple more breaths here, continuing to invite these qualities of stillness and stability in the body, and silence to the inner speech, and openness, clarity with the mind. Let's take a moment here to connect to our intention for gathering here a Sangha. For endeavoring to understand more about this heart mind. Consider the intention and aspiration that is essential to all practice. that we dedicate ourselves to waking up for the sake of all beings. We feel the importance of that. Notice how it might settle as a sensation in the chest. Maybe it feels like a burden or responsibility. Maybe it feels like a calling or a guiding light.
Consider igniting or fanning the flame of this aspiration. Considering an intention that might be more specific or personal for today. This intention could be so simple. Just seeking connection or strength, understanding. Consider your motivation and allow a single word or phrase to enter the heart and mind. Gently release these intentions, not pushing them away, but maybe imagining them just receding slightly into the background, still with you here in practice. And we'll shift now more to the memory and imagination. Begin by going back in time and recalling when you first opened your eyes this morning. Maybe it was light or still dark out. Can you recall what you saw around you? Do you recall the quality of your mind? Feelings, emotions, maybe your first thoughts. How did it feel to be in your body? Moving ahead in time to maybe the very beginning part of your day, a tea or a coffee. See if you can choose just one moment. And again, as though a snapshot, simply recalling what you saw around you, colors and shapes, maybe other beings. What was the quality of your mind then, the feelings or thoughts? Do you remember what it felt like in your body? sensations. As much as possible, don't get engaged in analyzing or stories, just a snapshot of recall. Move ahead in time now to the middle of your afternoon. Maybe it was busy and full, maybe quite spacious. Choose just one moment. What were you seeing? What were you thinking and feeling? How was it to be in your body?
moving ahead in time to however you arrived here today, whether that was opening your laptop or driving or biking or walking. Choosing one moment you recall, maybe walking in the front door of the center or when you first saw others arrive on the screen. What were you seeing? What were your thoughts and feelings? Can you recall what experiences you might have been having in the body? Moving ahead in time once more to this very moment. Fully arrived here. Noticing maybe the quality of light or shadow behind your eyelids. Noticing thoughts and feelings, quality of mind, maybe still, maybe busy, maybe bright, maybe dull. Gentle curiosity, noticing this moment. And once again, saturating our attention and awareness with the body. How is the body right now? And to continue our noticing of this present moment, we'll shift into settling the mind in its natural state, gently opening our eyelids, letting in a bit of light around us. And as though we were leaning back in our mind, we lean back into our awareness And notice, recognize the thoughts, memories, and images as they arise. With our clear mindfulness, not engaging with these thoughts, not getting taken for a ride. We observe this phenomena of the mind arising and passing away.
If you get caught up in a fantasy thought, maybe a to-do list, no problem. Relax, release whatever has captured your attention and return. Settling the mind in its natural state is settling the mind into its awareness, spacious, clear, open, sky-like. At any time, if the mind simply feels too busy, you can return to the breath, focusing on the exhale and releasing. If after a long day, the mind feels dull, lethargic, sleepy, you can return to the breath, really connecting to the inhale, the vividness. Otherwise, settling into this natural state of mind naturally clear, quite ordinary, yet in that simple, ordinary nature of mind, a sense of ease, openness, nothing pulling us to the future, nothing dragging us to the past, this moment.
Just a couple more moments here, feeling this sense of our awareness all around us. Anything that passes through the mind has all the space it needs to come and go. Nothing is a problem. Gently allowing our eyes to close. Regathering our awareness into the body. Thank you for your practice. Questions or reflections from practice? For our friends online, if you have a question, um, you can raise a hand, I think. I can see most of you. For our friends here, if you have a question, we might ask you to come. And I heard this mic doesn't come out so well. So I want to let one out. Great, it was so clear, or everybody slept through it, either way. Okay, no questions, no questions. All right. Thank you, that was beautiful. It's really good to be here, uh, second time in person. It feels good. I didn't realize how much I miss being around people <laughs> and practicing together. I'm kind of an introvert, so I liked a lot of the quietude of the pandemic, but um, I did miss this. So I'm happy to get to come here. I don't get to come across the bay every week or every time I teach, but when I can, I will. Uh, Eve lives, you know, in the neighborhood for the most part. And I live in Berkeley, so I have to plan ahead. But it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm I'm looking forward to the opening open opening the house, <laughs> opening the house on May 21st. Is it okay if I share a little bit about it? So uh, Eve will guide a meditation, and I have gathered some friends together. I, one of my hobbies is to play music and do kirtan. Yeah, and and we have some Buddhist mantra meditation and. 
uh, Hindu stuff too. And I've, I found a great tabla player, bassist and uh, maybe guitar, but I've got harmonium and I'll be singing. So we'll do about an hour of chanting. So mm. it, you know, it's a meditation, it's sound meditation. And you can sing or you can listen, we'll meditate a little bit in between, we'll hear stories. And it's a way to celebrate and bring, um, bring our voices together, our hearts together mm. to celebrate this quite the, the monumental feat you all have done, bringing us back into a space together in mm. the mission, not too far from our original home, which is just a few blocks down the road. And so that's going to be my contribution. I'm looking forward to it. We've had two rehearsals, <laughs> we've had two practices already, and I'm having so much fun. I think you're going to love it. We have some chants to Tara and to Buddha, to Krishna, <laughs> Amitabha. <laughs> It's going to be a, a wonderful smorgasbord of sound <laughs> meditation. So uh, today, as Eve said, we are on this really rich chapter 14, page 195. If you have the book on the path to enlightenment, heart advice from the great Tibetan masters. First checking in, how's the sound online? Everything OK? All right, good. So this is a really wonderful chapter. I think we'll probably spend a while on it mm. most of may maybe even it's really up to to eve but it's, it's not that it's kind of long mm -hmm. wow yeah this is a good juicy one so this is a common phrase view meditation and action or sometimes it's called conduct in the tibetan buddhist tradition uh view is ta or tawa in tibetan it means how do we see the world how do we see our mind how do we understand reality you know the view view is like it's like looking at a map before you go on a trip like what's the view what's my view how do i see the world where are we going where do we want to go where are we right now and so the view is about understanding emptiness about understanding karma about understanding like cause and effect like these basic foundational um, buddhist teachings that are so commonly shared four noble truths eight full noble path many of the stuff we've talked about over and over again. And there's a little request on the screen for maybe Noam to, to decline or enable. Okay, so, so Tawa is the view and that's our perspective really. What is our perspective? Hmm. Tawa, Tawa. It literally Tawa can also be a verb to see. So it's like, how do you see? How do you see the world? How do you see your inner world? Hmm. Is it clear? Is it foggy? You can say T A and then W A. You can just say Ta or Tawa is a noun. Yeah, Tawa. And then meditation is Gom or Gompa. If any of you have been in a Tibetan monastery, often their monasteries are called Gompa, right? Gompa basically means a place you Gom, <laughs> a place you Gom, which is to meditate, to familiarize yourself with practice, literally familiarize. So Gom or gompa as a noun. Mm. And that can be everything from mindfulness of the breath, meditating on karma, you know, the four thoughts that turn the mind. All of everything we do is a form of meditation. It can be non-discursive, like emptying the mind, releasing distraction. All of those practices are more non-discursive meditative practices. Or it can be discursive meditation practice where you're actually using the mind to transform the mind, like we did with feeding your demon, hmm. right? We use the mind to meet, dialogue with, heal those aspects of ourselves that we would normally repress or turn away from the so called demons, the blocks in our life. So that is using the mind to transform the mind, Donglen, sending and receiving, hmm. using the mind, metta, mantra recitation, hmm. using the mind to transform, to heal the body-mind, uh, come back home. So discursive forms of meditation, gompa, non-discursive forms of meditation, gompa, all valid, all beautiful, all effective at different times in our lives. Sometimes we need to empty the mind. Sometimes we need to use the mind because it's so full and active. Have you felt that? Like sometimes it's just practically impossible to empty the mind. <laughs> like, what? So you can use the mind and use the energy behind that distracted or busy mind mm. actually channel it chant mantra instead of trying to empty with the mindfulness of the breath or something. Mm. 
So Gompa has many different techniques, all the way from foundational to advanced, to advanced to foundational, everything in between. And then the third action or conduct, it's like, how are we in the world? Mm. How do we bring the ta and the gom, the view and meditation, into our behavior, into our relationships, into our work, into our life? And bring it off the cushion into the world. It's classic sayings. And that word is ch, chitpa. It sounds like the ch, like the practice of the bell and the dharma. Mm-hmm. But it's a different ch. It's a, it's a, it's, I won't go into the nerdy etymology, of it, although you like etymology, right? <laughs> we have some etymology geeks in the room, too, I think. Maybe not just me. But um, yeah, it's just like it's aspirated, it has a D ending, but it's a lower, it's a ch, not a ch. <laughs> Uh, which means to cut or sever. This means action. Ch means action or behavior or conduct. And so that is ethics. It's how are are we kind? Are we speaking truthfully? Are we abstaining from causing harm? Not taking what isn't ours. Virtues, non-virtues, ethical discipline, all of these foundational teachings are a part of conduct. But ultimately, also, really, what it is is to be imbued with compassion, Mm -hmm. right? So we might might not always be perfect, or we might stumble and do the wrong thing. But as much as possible, we're trying to bring a compassionate heart into our speech, our actions, and our thoughts. So that's really the teaching of conduct. So there's an overview. Okay. So Mm -hmm. the first the first section is great, but I'm really drawn to to go to number two, Atisha, Mm -hmm. on page 196. There are a lot of different um, quotes we could pull on. We're probably not going to do every one, every class. Uh, We'll see. So on page 196, I'd love to read this kind of short, beautiful teaching on Tha Gom Chit, Chit, view, meditation, behavior, action, by Atisha, the great teacher from India who brought the Lojong mind training teachings to Tibet. He's, he's, he's our man, really, isn't he? He's our man. He's our man. What's really cool about Atisha is he was really influenced by no, noble Tara, Mother Tara, Tara Ma, Mother Tara. She was um, like a guardian angel for him. She mm. came to him in visions and dreams and uh, is the one who said, go to Tibet, you'll benefit many beings. So, mm. uh, Tara is a very important figure in my life. She's a Buddha. You know, a bit of compassion. It's green Tara, red Tara. Do we have a Tara here? I was trying to see. No. Well, maybe we could get one. <laughs> I <can> get one. <laughs> I might have one I could lend to the center. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> Here's what Atisha said about uh, uh, view, meditation, and conduct. It's a story about this, what he said. One day, Dromten Ba, who's one of Atisha's main disciples, this is in Tibet. One day, Dromten Ba asked Atisha, is it possible to attain Buddhahood only by meditating on the view of emptiness, shunyata? Atisha replied, in whatever you see and hear, there is nothing that doesn't come from your mind. To recognize that mind is empty awareness, Devoid of any substance is the view. So that is the, really the main part of the mm. view. I'll read that again. To recognize that mind is empty awareness. Devoid of any substance is the view. I'll unpack this after I read the whole thing. To continuously maintain that recognition without distraction is the meditation. To maintain that recognition while acquiring merit and wisdom in the manner of an illusion is the action. If you make that a true inner experience, it will manifest in your dreams. If it manifests in your dreams, it will manifest at the moment of death. If it manifests at the moment of death, it will manifest in the intermediate state after death. 
In that case, you will be sure to attain the supreme accomplishment or Buddhahood. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's great. There's so much in there. Um, so in whatever we see or hear, really whatever phenomena appears to mm. our senses, not just seeing and hearing, but smelling, tasting, touching. And also they say in Buddhism, Buddhist psychology, that the mind is the sixth sense. So whatever comes through the five senses of the sight, smell, taste, or, um, oratory, or, you know, the ears, I'm going olfactory, <laughs> now, gustatory, tactile, and then that filters in through the mind. So that is why they say that is the sixth sense, because we're filtering all those other senses through the mind or the brain, and then we experience the world. So he's saying that whatever we see and hear and so on, there is nothing that doesn't come from your mind. So we can't take that too literally. You know, obviously Eve didn't come from my mind. <laughs> Not even my womb. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Not in this life. True. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. But all of my all of my appearance, all of the things that I perceive, the sounds, the beautiful being that's to me, everybody, taste, and so on. Mm -hmm filters through and I experience it, I can't separate that from my mind. I have to experience that through my mind, not through Eve's mind, mm. not through Mace's mind, not through Pamela's experience, no. You are all experiencing the world through your unique experience, your karmic makeup, your mind. And so in that way, all of the appearances, my voice, yeah, it is sort of, it is coming from my mouth into your ear, but ultimately you are experiencing it within the space of your mind. Mm. See what that, that's what that means. And then he says, to recognize that mind is empty awareness devoid of any substance is the view. So then we get to like what Eve was leading us to is that experience of settling the mind in its natural state where we, we can maybe have glimpses or tastes of by the end of the, the meditation so beautiful. It's like at a certain point you said sky-like. Mm. I was like, oh, I just love that word. It's kind of like skylight. <laughs> it's like open the portal, you know, the crown chakra, and let the, let the consciousness roam free in, mm. in space. Skylight, but also the skylight mm. can come in and permeate through. And so, uh, so we recognize that the mind is, is empty of awareness, devoid of substances, substance. Devoid of substances, maybe not, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> but devoid of substance, yes. Um, I just took a silly substance in the car, probably on the way over here. So I just I'm feeling pretty silly. But um, no, I didn't. But <laughs> empty awareness is like silly mind. You know, it's mm. like you are free. You're free of solidity. You're free of ego, of fear, and the guarding, and the needing to be perfect, or. Mm. Uh, right, you know, when you rest in empty awareness, it means that you are, you're free in mm -hmm. a sense of the binding nature of karma and fear that comes from that. And so, yeah, empty awareness can, is also like luminous awareness, mm -hmm. sky-like awareness, sky-light awareness. <laughs> uh, it is that spaciousness, that, that co arising, vibrant, mm -hmm. Um, effervescent lucidity that is the nature of your own, my own, your own mind, all of our own minds. And so to, it's empty. Why? Not because it's an airhead mind, but an empty awareness, not because it's like, mm. you know, numb or checked out. Empty, usually in Dharma speak, when you hear empty, you know it's a good thing. <laughs> and it means interdependent. It's co arising, it's ever effulgent. And, um, mm an empty fullness. So that's empty awareness. It's, it is, it's not a solid thing. It's empty of solidity. So that is the view. And then to continuously maintain that recognition that mind is empty of solidity is, and to do that without distraction is meditation. So you don't have to do that while you're just sitting in the SF Dharma Collective or on your cushion. You, 
doing that while you're driving, do that while you're talking on the phone, while you're mm -hmm. having a challenging meeting. If we can maintain that view while we're talking, listening, moving, walking, even sleeping, that's kind of more advanced work, mm -hmm. but um, then that is the meditative state, really. That's, that's really what the, the mavericks talk about, like bring it off the cushion into mm -hmm. the world. And then to maintain that recognition while acquiring merit and wisdom is the manner of an illusion. Okay, let's start that again. To maintain that recognition while acquiring merit and wisdom in the manner of an illusion is the action. So this is interesting this is a lot in here, but so a classic, a classic understanding and teaching in Buddhism mm -hmm. is that we move towards, we, we cultivate momentum towards awakening through cultivating merit on the one hand and wisdom on the other. And that's like, if you wanna know like what your vehicle towards awakening is, it's kind of stockpiling up, filling those mm. bank accounts of like, you know, so doing good, good, you know, kind acts, donating to SFTC, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being a good person, um, accumulating merit, you know, through saving lives, mm. you know, that's often in the Tibetan tradition, you have auspicious days where, where they will release millions of lives, of whether it's letting fish back into the ocean or lakes or buying up, you know, animals for the slaughter and setting them free to pasture, doing these types of things are considered meritorious acts. So cultivating merit, even like saying a kind word, I love you, I care for you, I hear you, that's a meritorious action. Mm -hmm. It's not just monetary. Yeah. Really witnessing somebody, <laughs> that's a generous act. So, um, and then the other part of this vehicle to awakening is then cultivating wisdom, mm -hmm. so understanding nature of reality as best as you can intellectually both and experimentally experientially uh, cultivating more wisdom in your life and becoming a well-seasoned human being where you um, can hold space mm -hmm. and not be afraid of going to those places that scare you as Pema children say mm -hmm. says and so in that way while maintaining the recognition of empty awareness without distraction, but also while acquiring merit and wisdom in the manner of an illusion. So, okay, we're doing that. We're in the world. We're trying to be a good person. We're trying to be more wise, be more kind, fill up the, you know, karmic bank account, good karma bank account, and move towards a greater sense of wholeness. But doing that without rigidity or solidity, but doing it as if this is all a dream, manner of an illusion. So not taking ourselves too seriously, you know, and recognizing that this is all a play at samsara, all of these appearances, the joy and the sorrows, everything mm. in between are expressions of, uh, you know, the ground of being is what they call it, the, the alaya vijnana, this ground of being, and that Sometimes it's going to be sunny, sometimes it's going to be rainy, things are always changing. Appearances are like a dream, they're always changing. And they lack solidity. So if you can be in the world with that understanding, be a kind person, be a wise person, but recognize all of this, your actions, my actions are like an illusion, mm -hmm. that is conduct. That is the conduct. So you don't have to memorize lists. <laughs> Get it all right. This is why I love this quote so much. Maybe I'll mm. pause there and see if Eve or mm. other people want to ask questions or make comments about that. Then we can talk about the dreams and all of that. I thought that was a cool mm. statement too. Mm. Yeah. How do you think about all that? I just want to say I, I so appreciate Chandra. I mean, I can't imagine how many hundreds, maybe thousands of times you've described those um, aspects and it felt just so fresh. And I think that is, it's a demonstration of this practice to like, we never, we never master it. This ongoing familiarizing with these really simple basic concepts all the time. 
right? It's for most of us, these ideas are, are familiar. Maybe it's only the second time, maybe again, it's been decades of thinking about them, but this idea that, wow, how I see the world is kind of different than how Walt sees the world maybe. And how I see the world is a little different today than it was yesterday. And maybe even different than when I walked in here, right? And that retrospective awareness practice, recognizing how my body felt this morning is maybe different than how my body feels now. What was in my mind? What were my thoughts? Always changing. Um, one thing that came up as you were as you were talking is I was thinking of you know a, an alternative to what's being proposed here. So what if our view, instead of being one of everything changing and being interdependent, is a view of I want a lot of things. That's my view. I want a lot of things. That's not unusual, right? That's a very popular view in our contemporary culture. So then our meditation might be craving, right? Like, hmm, gosh, that thing I want, and I'm gonna, you know, we're really just kind of getting deep into those trenches of the craving and the wanting. And our action then, right, we'll be making that in the world, trying to get as much as possible. And I think we see very clearly demonstrated, unfortunately, the downside of that view, that meditation, and that action through the dis destruction of our planet and feelings of scarcity and trying to edge others out. So when we think about, of course, this this path that uh, most of us, I would say, are intentionally most of the time treading upon, we think about the alternative. And it's not that we don't want stuff. We all we all want stuff. But how do we really engage meaningfully? Because it's it's we have to kind of think about the stakes. The stakes are high. Right. I'm so curious to hear from from you all. What is the view for you? Like, what is the view? What is that like? How do you see the world? It's hard. It's like that kind of famous, um, I guess you would call it an aphorism that's been quoted by many people, including David Foster Wallace on how do you know the water you're swimming in? It's just water. How do we know how we're seeing the world? It actually takes a lot of effort to see it. And so this is not meant to be a, uh, a test, a, a Dharma pop quiz, but curious, um, how do you view the world? Can, are you aware of the view, of the lens, of the way that you are interpreting everyday reality? It doesn't have to be um, as eloquent here as a Tisha, but <laughs> how would you describe that for your Dharma brothers and sisters? Walt, yes. Can I encourage you to speak at the mic? That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the idea of uh, of you and mine uh, brought me back to something that I, I probably first heard. Gosh, um, when I when I first uh, got into sobriety like mm. 34 years ago, and it, and it went something like, I believe, um, it's never too late to start your day over again. Mm. Like, you know, the, whole, the whole idea of, ah, oh, this day is in a dumpster, I might as well go out and have a shot and screw it. And I was like, no, mm. it's never too late to start your day over again. Mm. And again, it's just, Mind that's beautiful. In a different way, you know, look at reality mm. and approach it yeah. in a different way. Yeah, beautiful. But that, that struck me mm. coming out of the meditation. And for 34 years, maybe it's been useful, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Thank you. And I think such a beautiful example of the view doesn't have to be any of the words we say. Um, Oh, do I do I see a, a hand there, or is that a or just a wall? Thank I, you, Walt. Okay, I can't read that far. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Walt. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Ah, all drishtis are empty. Mm hmm. Yeah. And what does that mean to you? Or how does how does that help? Yeah. Just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, bring your mic back at least there. I don't know if it's still here. Anyone else? Yeah. I can comment. Okay, thank you. Um, mine. Yeah, I want to say that I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else but that. Hmm. So wonderful to hear you again in voice, mm -hmm. in person, and receiving. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it has taken so long. Mm -hmm. and it has been. A very tough learning. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Oh, Brandon. I, I think I think Lindsay uh, started to talk there a second. Oh, Lindsay, ago. please. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that my aspirational view is that all beings are bodhisattvas, which I tried to. Mm. old when someone's driving me crazy or I just feel animosity toward a random person on the street I try to hold that view mm. beautiful that reminds me of your everywhere is already a pure land there's a continuity for you here I that really yeah. stuck with me Lindsay I've been thinking about how you said that in our um couple weeks ago now that's a it's a good one it's a pure land full of bodhisattvas who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, despite appearances. <laughs> Contrary to what we might see. That's beautiful. Start speaking to the illusion. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yes, please. Mm. question was, can you explain the action piece a little more? So yeah, action, conduct, it's basically your behavior in the world. So how do you bring your view and meditation into your actions and behavior? That's basically it in a nutshell. Yeah. From the book. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so, so that sentence says, to maintain the recognition while acquiring merit and wisdom in the manner of an illusion is the action. So it's like, you know, acting, but also recognizing the empty nature of your actions, meaning that there's no inherent doer or subject, there's no inherent object, and there's no inherent action between the two. Like, they exist, but they're co-arising, so they're mm. empty of solidity. That's, is it the illusion part that's confusing? Or what, what's... So basically, I guess I could it could give an example like often the teachings on generosity, which one is, is one of the six perfections, as you know, right? Generosity is the first one, <laughs> Donna. Um, they say imbue your actions of generosity, whether it's giving a gift or giving kind words or in actions, imbue your action with the understanding of the threefold emptiness, mm. which is emptiness of self who's doing the giving, the other who's receiving that gift, and then the action in between. It's a threefold emptiness, meaning that all of those are co-arising and interdependent, and they exist in relationship to each other, so they're not separately existing things hmm. in that moment, the act of generosity. Yeah. 
So for example, if you were generous with the hope of someone seeing you mm -hmm. be generous or that it would give you something in return, then that would be... Exactly. So then by extension, you're, you avoid solidifying me as a generous person or this, they better be appreciative of this gift. I hope I get something in return. The Dharma Center should stay open yeah. forever because I gave $10. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. More cookies. Basically, it's the, the illusion <laughs> thing is like, the, the life is a dream, you know, mm. so don't solidify or reify any of that. It's, it's, you know, pretty much is that familiar to you? That, you know, yeah. Do you want to go farther? You want to ask, nuance that a little bit so that maybe we can help you? Mm. Right, right. So Mesa is saying she's missing the bridge between the relative and the ultimate. And yeah. Yeah, and you and it's yeah, yeah. and that's probably just yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, has it just been a decade? Has it been, I really been like, <laughs> this lifetime. <laughs> it's like 15 years, maybe. Yeah. I'm not making fun of your questions. I'm just saying, we've, I think we've been going, you know, we've been talking this stuff for a long time for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really almost like a fault of the, uh, the teachings or the teacher. You know, that, mm. to, that that hasn't been more digestible for you, I think. Probably mm. more of the fault of the teacher. No, mm. I think it creates the relative and ultimate. It creates such a divide, like the relative's over here and ultimate's over here. Mm. Whereas actually, they're not separate. The relative exists because it's ultimate. Because the relative comes into manifestation because ultimately it's empty of solidity. Right? There's even another quote in here by Dilgo Kyanse Rinpoche who says, things can exist because they are empty. They are co-arising and interdependent. That's why birth can happen. Birth can happen because death can happen. None of those things would happen if things weren't ultimately empty of its intrinsic existence. So ultimate truth is just emptiness. Like if you peel back the label on ultimate truth, you'd say emptiness. That's all it is. And, and emptiness is on the other side is dependent origination. It's tendril. Basically, emptiness is one side of the coin. Tendril is the other. If you want to see the world from if you want to see the reality from ultimate perspective, you'd say it's empty hmm. of of solidity. If you want to see the world from the relative perspective, you'd say it's co-arising, dependent reality, tendril. They're not, it's not, they're like part of the same reality. They're mm -hmm. me, they're you. It's both relative, you, you are relative and ultimate in the same breath. And, and in a way, that's what they're saying is do the conduct, but recognize that everything's fluid and changing. Mm -hmm. That it's not a conduct here with a label on it that's stuck in solidity and a thing. I just think it's it's so challenging that um, that bridge means like it's such a challenging bridge between at an ultimate level everyone's already already free but right now we are suffering and like so many of us are suffering and where do we even begin so then when we think of how do we bring this view and this understanding into action it can be really, it's, it's, it can be pseudo paralyzing. If I'm committing every single time I practice to wake up for the sake of all beings, how do I do that? And at an ultimate level, okay, wait, I don't need to because it's already happening, but then at a relative. And so I, I love this, um, just that call to the co arising and that, I don't know, it's interesting. I think Yeah, I guess this, what's coming up for me in this moment is is how we apply that even to our own selves. First, right, is, you know, if ultimately I'm 
at an ultimate level, I'm already the awake being I seek to be. That's nice. And I still need to put my butt on the cushion every day. Right. So where where is that in between where we're kind of finding that union where our action, our conduct supports our view of ultimate? Yeah. Thank you for stirring the pot. I want to say, I want to say I'm having an inspiration here that maybe will help you and everybody. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a phrase like, I love you. I love you. You say it, hopefully, not often, not <laughs> too uncommonly. I love you. Okay, who, what is in that sentence? You have subject, object, and then something, the goo in between, which is the love. So I love you. So when we say that, it's like a relative level truth, right? Mm. Like I'm over here and you're over there and I love you. That's true. But on an ultimate level, there is no I and there is no you. We are one and it's love. There is love. So those are the two sides of the same coin. Mm. Yes, we play in duality. And it's kind of fun because I get to love you. <laughs> Maybe you love me. Pamela, don't get jealous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet, non duality is also really fun because we get to come together and experience mm -hmm. a union of not being separate. Like, ultimately, we're not, ultimately, we are one mind. So me saying, I love you, is the action. So I'm saying the love. So that's why I'm saying that. Like, that's an action, right? That's conduct. I'm saying, I love you. And I can say that in duality, and I can say it in non-duality. I can hmm. feel it in duality, and I can feel it in non-duality. They can both be true at the same time. That's why it's like an illusion. Because in a way, the illusion that I'm over here and you're over there, and that there's an I loving you, there's a Chandra loving Mace, or a Noam loving Eve, or whatever. Uh, that's the duality. That's illusory. Mm. Because ultimately, we are not separate. But if we we're walking around fused all the time and be weird and couldn't get anything done. <laughs> so the action is the love, as I'm loving mm. you. But I can, so experientially, I can say that with the recognition that I'm not separate from you, but I can still feel love for you. And without the, and without the view in meditation, it could be a very attached love, yeah. right? Of like, I love you, you're mine. I love you when you're nice, yeah. right? This kind of like non, it's very contingent. So, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I hope that you can sit in a dyad with Pam at home and say, I love you, <laughs> I love you, and meditate on that, feel the, the relative level <laughs> truth of it and the non-relative, the ultimate level truth of it. Can you come up here and talk to mine? Just for the folks on that, because I have a feeling what you're going to say is might be better to directly come. I just think it's important to think about Western psychology, because I think it's a big deal in terms of like the teachings that we're studying came from a completely different cultural mm. context and understanding. And Western psychology and the whole like mechanistic universe, starting back in you know the Greco Roman times with Aristotle and whatnot, and like that that sort of perhaps today in this context unhelpful idea that the universe is not a living mm. whole that comes into expression and falls away from expression and comes into expression, but there is that fullness that mm. is in and of itself. What, and these typical words, I don't mean this in a mean way or a disrespectful way, but emptiness, I think, doesn't support 
that sense mm. of this living, mm. undulating kind of consciousness that we all, perhaps the teachings seem to speak, that that is what they're talking about. Mm. That is the quote, Shunya power is the emptiness of the empty fullness, or like when the bell, like the sound of the bell, like that is like this clearing, but it's a fullness at the same time, you know? And I think like in Western psychology, it's very challenging to, because of just like, you know, thousands of years of this particular belief system that many of us have been indoctrinated with, like it's just part of our view. Um, it's hard to make that, it's hard to, be, to go from the, the uh, mechanistic reality into this kind of undulating world. Yeah. And I think sometimes the teachings don't always address that because they're coming from like, yeah. sort of like, I don't know. I love I what I hear from what you're sharing, Pamela, and I really appreciate it is um, when maybe these terms were being used, there was a little bit more interconnection with the natural world, the more than human world, right? Our ability to feel connected to the elements all around us, to you know all of the living beings, plant beings. So when we say emptiness it almost has like a little bit of an austerity as though there's there's nothing instead of fullness interconnection and not just one thing so yeah thank you for bringing and it's you know i i love my travel coming here like just from my house not that far but just really taking everything in and the passing of time but also that dynamic interplay i don't know who saw the fog coming down the hill and then the light on the trees and the people move. I mean, it's the full, as you said, undulation, right, of things coming and going and not being like, I liked it when that tree was not there or, you know, like, why'd they cut that one down? And what, you know, just the, the letting and allowing and openness that can create that sense of freedom. I think that a lot of our teachings are pointing towards. <laughs> we only got through one. <laughs> and then they, we didn't finish it. That's a true inner experience, experience. So let's see if we can okay. just. So the last section here kind of caps it off, which is like the why, why? Okay, why do we do that? Well, hmm. he says if you make that an inner, a true inner experience, you're unifying those three view, meditation, conduct, or action, and hold that view while you're going about your life, if you can really make that a true inner experience, it will manifest in your dreams. So in your waking life, if you're really steeping in it, then it will come through in your dreams. And, and Alan talks a lot about lucid mm. dreaming, our teacher, um, and how really when you're in a lucid or when you're dreaming and then you become lucid in a dream, you can do things with what much more ease and efficacy than in the waking life, you're much more subtle. So if you're trying to learn a language or learn a concept or mm. learn a meditative experience or a nature of mind, you're right, trying to taste the nature of mind. If you can come to it through lucid dreaming, it can you can taste it. It can be quite phenomenal. Mm. And so if you if you manifest it in your life, then it will manifest more likely in your dream states. If it manifests in your dreams, then it will manifest at the moment of death, because the moment of death, when we're really releasing from the body and consciousness is kind of releasing from the solidity and the identification of the physical form as being who it is, and it's being released from the density, the veils that are created by being in a body, mm. you have, again, like in a dream state, you have more facility with it, more ease, and more clarity of mind. They say something like consciousness is eight times more clear, lucid in the bardo, when, the di when it's not fused with the body. And so if you're already training it up in the dream state, then the bardo state, you'll be less likely to reify appearances like gargoyles or demons or scary things or hells as real. You're less likely to grasp onto those and reify them as some mm. real thing and go, ah, you know, but you'll see it as an illusion, as a projection of the mind as a filter of the karmic imprints that are just cleansing them, you know, off-gassing, you could say, uh, and not reifying them, then you can real come back home to the natural state, what you've been training up on, 
mm. nature of mind, natural state. So this understanding, this inner experience will manifest at the moment of death. And it will manifest in the intermediary state that follows that moment of death. So there's the death moment, and then there's the experience of the bardo, which is this intermediary state between one life and the next. And in Buddhism, they say this lasts for about 49 days, seven mm -hmm. cycles of seven. And it's the whole interesting process. There's this classic book called the Tibetan Book of, of, of Death, the Dead, which is not really what it's called. It's called Bardo Tudro. Liberation upon hearing in the bardo, but to popularize it, Evans Wentz called it the Tibetan <laughs> Book of Dying, Death, whatever. And so, in any case, this bardo is fascinating. And if we can hold the view through even the dying and then the bardo state, hmm. then he says, in that case, you will be sure to attain supreme accomplishment. What's the supreme accomplishment in terms of Buddhist speak? Buddhahood, it's awakening. It's, hmm. Rigpa, recognizing your intrinsic, luminous, loving nature. I like to say it's basically love. I, all this other stuff is kind of sterile. But love, that you are love. You know? mm. Come back home to love. <clears throat> and uh, so that's, that's the point. What's the point? That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we do this? Hmm. Can you write it down? Do you want to dedicate our merit? Okay. I knew it would pass quickly, but that was really yes. lightning. Okay. Feeling yourself in the in the space with your view, your meditative state, your your actions, even as much as breathing as an action, as a conduct, self cares, conduct, mm. and viewing all of this with a loving sense of patience and spacious care, compassion. Recognize that we are not separate. And through that connection, we dedicate any positive energy of our practice for the enfoldment and the health and well-being and liberation of all beings everywhere. Don't forget to include yourself. Though. Like a drop of water releasing into the vast ocean, our dedication of our small amount of merit, when we dedicate it, it fuses with the vast ocean of positive energy and becomes limitless. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your practice, everyone. So wonderful to be here. See you next week for more. And yes, definitely please tell all your friends about the 21st. It's a Saturday, just for the record. I think Tate four. might be doing something too, maybe. I don't know if it's confirmed. Should I not say that? Do I say that too soon? Oh, no. Oops. <laughs> There will be fun. There will be fun. Fun will be had. Sorry. Celebration. Yeah, come and see the surprise offerings from other people as well. <laughs>